Good morning. Welcome to the home of Calgary Unitarians, whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on your journey of faith or search for meaning, welcome. If you're visiting for the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time, please know that we are very grateful to have you with us. We come together in beloved community to grow in wisdom and welcome and deepen relationships and act for a just and sustainable world. We also recognize our responsibility to be stewards of this land and acknowledge that we do this with those for whom this is their traditional territory. The people of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Confederacy comprising the Sitsika, Pikane, Dainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Nakoda, also known as Stony, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, Wesley First Nations of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Signed September 22nd, 1877. Mokinstis, now known as the city of Calgary, is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. In offering a land acknowledgement, we honor those who have long been the stewards and accept our shared responsibility for being good caretakers. We acknowledge that treaties were entered into as a collaboration between settlers and the Indigenous people, making us all treaty people. So my name is Leslie Robinson. I use the pronouns she, her, hers, and I have the privilege of serving on your board of trustees. I started coming to this church, this congregation, 10 years ago and found a loving space of sanctuary as I made significant changes in my life. I continue to come because of the good people doing good work in the world and always that loving space of sanctuary. Please join us after the service for a virtual coffee hour where we will meet in small breakout rooms and get a chance to socialize. And now to Pam. We light our chalice this morning to the words of Jennifer McLaughlin, like the first hint of green. As the first hint of green begins to peek through the barren ground, as that little sprig grows into a healthy stem, as that stem grows into a stalk and forms a bud, as that bud slowly opens with each new day to form a yellow daffodil. Let us be like that first hint of green renewed by the warm of the sun's rays and ready to emerge with a new energy, ready to face the day. We light this chalice to bring a glimmer of that warmth into our space. Good morning and welcome to our virtual service this morning. We'll take a few minutes as we begin to thank the people who made this worship service possible this morning. Uh, many people bring, come together to enable this service. Uh, thanks first to our tech team, Paul and Jim, and to Mitch who helps with our rehearsal, to Ev for the PowerPoint, and Bob, who will put our service together on YouTube later today. We thank Kelsey for managing our coffee break, uh, breakout rooms and Leslie for her greetings from the board. I thank the inhabitants of my garden for the beautiful flowers we have on our chalice table this morning. And we thank Jane for bringing us music and song and Sheila for bringing us word from the children and for sharing a story with us this morning. And I also thank my worship uh, facilitator team, Pam and Kathy. Uh, the three of us work together to create this service for you this morning. And now we go to our director of music, Jane Perry. Good morning, friends. 
We've been living in this virtual space for about 16 months now, and I know at the beginning we were really mourning uh, not being able to get together on Sunday mornings to worship together, but I like to think that after 16 months, this is now a bright spot for lots of us in our week to gather on a Sunday morning and sing together. So come and sing a song with me. this morning are the poem Peonies by Mary Oliver. This morning the green fists of the peonies are getting ready to break my heart as the sun rises, as the sun strokes them with his old buttery fingers and they open, pools of lace white and pink, and all day the black ants climb over them, boring their deep and mysterious holes into the curls, craving the sweet sap, taking it away to their dark underground cities. And all day under the shifty wind, as in a dance to the great wedding, the flowers bend their bright bodies and tip their fragrance into the air and rise, their red stems holding all that dampness and recklessness gladly and lightly. And there it is again, beauty the brave, the exemplary, blazing open. Do you love this world? Do you cherish your humble and silky life? Do you adore the green grass and its terror beneath? Do you also hurry, half-dressed and barefoot, into the garden and softly and exclaiming of their dearness, fill your arms with the white and pink flowers, with their honeyed heaviness and their lush trembling, their eagerness to be wild and perfect for a moment before they are nothing forever. And now to our Director of Religious Education, Sheila, who will share what the children and youth are doing today and will also share a story. Good morning, everyone. It is so nice to see all of you. Some days I feel like it's a little bit like romper room and I should get out my magnifying glass and name everybody. Uh, and, you know, they never called Sheila. All the years I was watching that show, they never called Sheila. But 
anyway, um, I'm so happy to see all of you. I'm Sheila, uh, and my pronouns are she and her. And this morning, we're talking about celebrating flowers. And so the children and youth are going to be doing some flower crafts today, and they're going to be talking about the meanings of flowers and how nature connects with our own spirituality. And this week's CYRE Children and Youth Newsletter, I've got a paper plate craft you might want to check out, and it just uses items you might have in your own home from recycling or things you can get from the garden. And it's just a fun way to connect with your own creativity this week. And my husband Arno this morning picked me some lilacs. And oh, I love them because they remind me of the Tibetan sand paintings that are made. They're so intricate, but they're they're made all day and then end of the day they're gone. And I feel that way about lilacs. They're only here for a week or so. So to me, they're just extra precious. And flowers, I always think about joy and hope. And so today's story is called Hope is an Open Heart. And let me just share that with all of you. There we go. Hope is an Open Heart by Lauren Thompson. which is happening very shortly now. <laughs> there we go. All right, my buttons are now working. Hope, sometimes hope feels far away, but hope is always there. Hope is the warmth of strong arms around you. Hope is sad tears flowing, making room for joy. Hope is angry words bursting, making room for understanding. Hope is scared words asking for help and finding that help is there. Hope is knowing that you are loved and hope is knowing that you love others. And hope is holding tight to your mother's hand. Hope is your father's goodnight kiss. And hope is remembering his kisses when he can't be there with you. Hope is finding happiness in simple things. And hope is daring to do something you've never done before. Hope is remembering that you are not alone and many others feel just the way you do, and many others care. And hope is a candle flame in the darkness. And hope is the clear sky above the gray clouds, and hope is the glistening of snow when the storm has passed. And hope is a heart that is open to the world around you. And hope is knowing that things can change and that we can help to change for the better. And hope is always there inside of you, waiting to unfold. And my hope for all of you today is that may this be a day to slow down and to smell the flowers and to find that small moment of joy. And now to Pam for our candles of care. Let us take a moment to tend the sacred bonds that bind our lives together. Those relationships that are the foundation of beloved community. We recognize ourselves as part of an independent, interdependent web of existence affirming that what touches the life of one of us affects us all. In these moments, we seek to widen our caring ministry by sharing the joys, sorrows, concerns, and milestones in our own lives and in the life of the congregation. We invite you to hold in your heart, speak aloud, or post in the chat your personal concerns or the concern you extend out to others. 
for all the concerns spoken and shared today, as well as those held in the silence of our hearts, we light this candle. There are joys and milestones in our midst as well. We take time to celebrate achievements, recoveries, new family arrivals, and newcomers in our midst. We invite you again to hold it in your heart, speak aloud, or post in the chat your personal joys or the joys you share with others. For all that has been held, spoken, and shared, and for the guests among us, we light this candle of joy. And we light our global candle today with hearts burdened by the recent discovery of at least 250 children's bodies buried at the Kamloops Residential School. We hold in our hearts all those in this country and around the world who have and still do suffer under colonization. And we recognize our responsibility to engage in truth and reconciliation. With this, we light our global candle. The language of flowers. It's called floriography. Flowers have always been associated with emotions, haven't they? What's in a name, asked Shakespeare in Romeo and Juliet. That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. But would it? A red rose for love, a white rose for consolation, or a yellow one for endings, all of them about love. Or the poppy for remembrance, so powerful that it worn over the heart at special times around the world and humanity's attempts to cope with the terrible emotions evoked by the losses of war. And then there's lilies for sorrow, daisies for innocence. As the notion of romantic love grew, especially in the Victorian era, flowers took on a special secret meaning, especially for women who did not have the same freedom of expression in society. With the presence of a certain flower in a bouquet, though, she could communicate a lot. For instance, the inclusion of a sweet pea in the bouquet meant, meet me by moonlight. Apple blossoms could mean, I choose you. Or a carnation could mean, uh, no, the answer is no. Flowers could speak to friendship, expressing gratitude, loyalty, concern with forget-me-nots, oleander, or hope with snowdrops and crocuses. How you received flowers also indicated a lot. Placed on the right side, it signified friendship. But if you pinned it over your heart, well, that meant something much deeper. Flower codes soon were made into dictionaries of flowers and a cultivating of special gardens or hothouses for better communication became the fashion. Sending a ribbon wrapped bouquet from your own garden was like our own present uses of emoji, except it also included the flower's distinct scents. And the wildflower? The magic and renewal of nature in the green world, as in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, where the untended garden leads into another world where anything is possible. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and no nodding violets grow, over canopied with woodbine, sweet musk roses, and eglantine. You step off into a fairy world which we'll do now with Mariana Louise. I'm going to share with you a homily by Gary Kowalski. Um, it is a homily that he has given at a flower communion service. Flower power. When I think of power, strength, sheer physical force, I think of an avalanche. Tons of thundering snow, come falling down the side of a steep mountain with the speed and irresistible force of a locomotive or a freight train. In an instant, an avalanche can sweep away everything in its path. But there's something even more powerful than an avalanche, and that's a glacier. A glacier doesn't move as fast as an avalanche. It can be slow. 
inching forward a few yards in the course of an entire year. But glaciers are enormous, a creeping river of ice that can move boulders like matchsticks and grind smaller rocks to fine powder. Avalanches and glaciers are powerful forces of nature, very strong, giants of the natural world. But there is something even stronger in nature, and that would be a flower. I'm thinking of the avalanche lily and the glacier lily. Each spring, as the snow begins to melt in the high mountains, these tiny flowers push their slender green stalks upward through the softening ice, through the wintering cr wintry crust and into the warming sun. The avalanche lily has white flowers with a yellow center, and the glacier lily is all yellow. Neither is very big. Compared to a glacier, they're tiny. The flowers are just an inch or two in size, but the bud is inside a growing green stem that pierces right through the cold overlay of February and March and brightens into the promise of April and a brand new season. Flowers themselves are newcomers on the earth. For in the beginning, millions of years ago, there were no flowers. There were ferns, there were fungi, there were dull mossy colored plants that spread and reproduced by means of spores. But there were no orchids or azaleas, no blossom of apple, peach, or pear, no fields of grass or daisies or brightly colored wildflowers. It was a monotonous world, not only dull in color, but also dull in sense and feeling. For this was the age of dinosaurs, great hulking lizards who ruled the earth through brute force. They were giants of the animal kingdom, big and powerful but dumb, like an avalanche or a glacier. They were no match for flowers, you understand. Toward the end of the age of dinosaurs, about a hundred million years ago, something strange and very wonderful happened. Plants learned how to do a new thing. They learned how to produce through seeds. Unlike the spores that preceded them, seeds were actually tiny organisms, embryonic but ready to grow, packaged like meals to go with a built-in store of nutrition. And that gave the world an entirely new source of edible and abundant energy, energy that could be converted into heat. That boosted the temperature of the four-legged and flying creatures up a notch from cold-blooded to warm. Birds and mammals appeared. The limbic system that governs emotions was laid over the old reptilian brain and the inner landscape changed. Love appeared and loyalty and grief, tears and laughter, curiosity and play, all made possible by the blooming plants that had turned the earth into a botanical buffet of rare fragrances and sweet perfumes. So with the invention of seeds came all of the birds that feed on seeds, the cardinals, the grosbeaks, the finches, and the grass made grasslands and all the creatures that thrive on the gra grassland, horses and zebras and prairie dogs, antelope and deer. And plants learned how to produce fruit and the fruit also provided meals for monkeys and chimpanzees and finally for you and me. No wonder flowers are the symbol of springtime and hope. There have always been though em empires that have established their rule through sheer raw power. Kingdoms of this world based on military domination of their neighbors. They were no match for flowers or the man who shared them. Norbert Chapik was a Unitarian minister who lived in the last century in the city of Prague. His home and his church were overrun by German soldiers in the years of World War II. 
He gave his life, defying their cruel occupation. But before he died, he influenced thousands of people with the beauty of his words and ideals, including the flower ceremony that he originated, symbolizing the light and color and fragrance of many creeds, many cultures, and many races joining together in a bright, living bouquet. The Nazis are gone now, but the flower ceremony continues to be celebrated in this congregation and hundreds of others around the world. A testament to the power of love to withstand hate and to the vision of a tolerant faith which sweeps the world not by persecution or threats of violence, but by drawing people to its principles and with the sweet scent of peace and freedom. So the flowers that we celebrate this morning bring us the assurance that warmth and kindness can pierce through the frost of cruelty and indifference, that mercy and decency will blossom, that goodness has deep roots and will prevail. What seems most fragile and perishable is most persistent and enduring. World community, justice and charity will ultimately prevail. And now Jane Perry, our director of music, will introduce our next song. So a common thread through our service this morning is the theme of hope, flowers and spring and returning birds exemplifying hope. From Sheila's story, hope is the knowledge that things can change. And of course, all of us have within us the creative power to help things to change, to help to create the world we want to see and to be the change we want to see in the world. Uh, Reverend Norbert Chapek understood all of that when he wrote this next hymn, uh, Color and Fragrance, for his European congregation. Let's sing now together that song. Great. 
into our centering time. You've been invited to bring a flower with you this morning. If you don't have a flower with you, we are providing some flowers on your screen. Um, we are able take some deep breaths. Let go of all the busyness of life and take a moment now to contemplate your flower. Notice it has a center, a focal point from which everything radiates. Ask yourself where your own center lies. Notice your flower's petals and leaves. Does it have any scars from battles with the elements or from being picked? Can you see the flower's beauty? Are you willing to see past your own imperfections to see your own beauty? So we shall continue our meditation. Um, flowers have roots closely hugging the earth. Where do you draw your own strength and nourishment? Though not attached, are you fully grounded and present in your life? When we leave the service today, may we grow in beauty, in light, in cheer and joy and share our gifts as freely as these pleasant flowers bloom. We give thanks for the abundance of flowers in our world and the many ways we incorporate their beauty and symbolism into our lives. May we always be aware that they are living entities that offer themselves freely and may we never take their gift for granted. And may we do the same for each other in this beloved community. Gardening, a spiritual practice. There was no gardening in my background until the 70s, when as a ridiculously young wife in a community where growing a vegetable garden was as expected as regular house cleaning, 
I dutifully dug a big patch in the backyard and planted seeds. After the initial excitement of radish plants poking through the ground, always the first to come up, the garden quickly became just one more job, weeding and watering, battling cabbage moths, potato beetles, and radish worms. And then the freezing, pickling, and canning. At the age of 19, the joy of gardening completely escaped me, let alone any idea of it being a spiritual practice. Now fast forward 20 years and you find me in Vancouver, living in a townhouse with nothing but concrete around it, but with a rooftop deck and a new husband, one who doesn't expect me to do all the work and who loves flowers. Every summer he fills pots with petunias and impatience and hangs baskets overflowing with pink mauve and red fuchsia all around the deck. There's no gardening work involved, just planting, watering, and enjoying. It was in Vancouver, within the sisterhood of a Unitarian women's group, that I first heard gardening referred to as spiritual practice. Two of our members had houses with gardens, and when they hosted meetings, they would take us around the flower beds and the vegetable plots and talk about tending them with a warmth and reverence far distanced from hard work. Intrigued, I suggested to Robert that we join a community garden. He was enthusiastic and together we planned and planted our box. Now influenced by indigenous ways I had been learning about, I planted a little sage bush at one end. Every time I arrived at our little plot, I started by rubbing some sage between my fingers and inhaling the aroma. Instead of working in the garden, I moved slowly around it, picking weeds out so gently and greeting the plants and the, excuse me, and the weeds as they poked out of the ground and started reaching for the sun. I was often alone, but sometimes my visit would coincide with others and their presence added another dimension, a deeper experience. One fellow gardener, admiring our thriving plants, asked about that silver green gray plant at one end. When I told her it was sage, she replied, oh, that's your secret. You smudge your garden. Fast forward again another 10 years, and Robert and I have moved to Medicine Hat where we can afford to buy an actual house on a 50 by 150 foot lot, undreamt of in Vancouver. With their escaping in mind, we dug up all the lawn, front, back, and side. Robert built boxes in the back for vegetables, and we designed a flower garden in the front, complete with gravel paths winding through it. Now, vegetable seeds are relatively inexpensive, but flower plant, plants, I quickly learned, can really add up. So that first year, I planted vegetables in the back and potatoes in the front. Two bags of seed potatoes cut into pieces, planted in the ground, and abracadabra potatoes for the whole winter, with enough to give plenty away. One day, when I was digging up potatoes, a little boy and his mother came walking by and stopped to see what I was doing. I showed him how I dug under a plant and found potatoes. He was amazed. He'd never seen a potato in the ground before. And we started composting. I came to love being out in the compost heap, turning over what had been kitchen refuse and watching it turn into soil, the alchemy of it. I became enchanted by the magic. I saw myself as a pagan hag, a witch, turning scraps into soil and seeds into food. I found myself casting spells, rind of melon, scat of worm, turn me now into table bounty. By the second summer, I had met some of my neighbors, mostly by them stopping to see what the heck I was doing with a potato patch in my front yard. 
and they started offering flower plants. They were thinning out of their gardens. Before long, they had a front flower garden, almost completely populated with free offspring from my neighbor's yards. Magic. My gardens, both flower and vegetable, now surrounded the house. In the absence of a Unitarian community, my gardens became my sacred space, pulling weeds, tending plants, picking produce, admiring the colors and shapes of the flowers became meditative practice. One year, our 18-year-old granddaughter came to live with us, escaping a problematic relationship, trying to find her own way in the world. She would come often out to the garden, crouch down beside me, and start picking weeds, and eventually bring something up that was bothering her, or something she was just trying to work out. She didn't need to look at me. She just picked and talked. The garden was a space where we could just meander through worries, thoughts, and ideas, another sort of magic. Now here in Calgary, Robert and I are in a condo again with just a concrete patio to call our own. But we put flowers on the patio and beyond our patio, our building is surrounded by lawn and flower beds and our residents have a volunteer garden crew. Among the flowers are mint, garlic and chives, which anyone is invited to harvest and flowering sweet peas that we're encouraged to pick and bring indoors. And we all participate in chasing squirrels out of the flower beds. Magic again, the magic of community conjured through growing, tending and sharing. Here in Calgary, Robert and I have the spiritual practice of gardening, gardening with our neighbors, as well as a spiritual home with Calgary Unitarians. Together, we make magic in these sacred spaces. So if you have an order of service, you might be expecting Leslie, but as you can see, it's Mariana Louise. Uh, the internet appears to be struggling to keep us connected this morning, but that will not deter us. We are just as powerful as those little flowers coming through the ice. So I invite you now to think about the value of this congregation to you. Uh, one way we can show our appreciation is to give as generously as we can to support the work of our congregation and to take care of all the physical resources that we need to have in place. Uh, like Zoom and our church building, so that we can come together each week, whether it be in person or whether it be virtually, and share this time together, and also do the other work that we do in the community, our connections with the interfaith community and with the Calgary Alliance for the Common Good. Um, so we thank you for your contributions to the work of our congregation. closing words this morning are another poem by Mary Oliver. I had a dog who loved flowers. I had a dog who loved flowers. Briskly she went through the fields, yet paused for the honeysuckle or the rose, her dark head and her wet nose touching the face of every one with its petals of silk and its fragrance rising into the air where the bees their bodies heavy with pollen hovered, and easily she adored every blossom. 
not in the serious, careful way that we choose this blossom or that blossom, the way that we praise or don't praise, the way that we love or don't love, but the way we long to be that happy in the heaven of earth, that wild, that loving. And now to Jane for our closing song, De Colores. Another expression of hope is through joy. And this next song is a Spanish folk song that allows us to engage in some joyful singing, which is what joy is all about in my universe. So let's sing together, De Colores. permanence and perfection, resist change, are blind to our shortcomings. We become caught up in the petty issues and routine activities of our daily lives. The flowers we have celebrated today are transient and sometimes imperfect, and yet they are of infinite value. As we leave this space today and move into the coming week, may we be reminded by the flowers we encounter that despite their imperfections, they still have integrity. And though they are transient, they contain the seeds of transcendence. Let us then also open ourselves to mystery and wonder, to change and imperfection, and give our gifts freely into the world. With these words, we extinguish our chalice. And as we come to the end of our service together today, it is my delight to invite you all to our virtual coffee hour. To get to the virtual coffee hour, all you have to do is to click on the link that just appeared in the Zoom chat area of your screen. Whether you're a longtime member or a first time visitor, we'd be so happy to have you with us. So please consider joining us for coffee. And now let's sing together our closing benediction, Spirit of Life. <laughs> 